we are going to let our audience now come up to ask questions. Again, it's not a word ask you to be said, make sure that the question is about the subject and we're not giving any health advice here. I will let Nathan and Avi take care of that and just make sure that you filled out your bio. We're not letting anyone who doesn't have bios filled out to come up on stage. Also, FYI, we are recording this. So if you come up on stage to ask a question, uh, that means you consent to us using your voice in the recording. Okay, great. Our first uh, audience members, Aaron, uh, can you ask, come up and uh, ask your question? Uh, sure. So do you guys think that and, or have you ever considered that it's possible that we're looking at the wrong side of the equation when looking at aging in general? The metaphor I'm going to use here is if we were trying to figure out how to fly, you wouldn't look at all the creatures that don't fly and try to figure out like how to fly based on that. You'd be looking at things that fly. So do you think that maybe we should be looking at regeneration as the trait rather than aging as the trait? Or have you considered that um, possibility? Oh, I'll take that. Uh, uh, in a certain sense, we, we're we looking at both. We're looking at extremely long-lived individuals. We're looking at long-lived uh, animals uh, like bowhead. And we're also looking at bona fide cases of aging reversal. So as you say, the, the animals with wings, would the equivalent would be things like reversing the state of a cell from, say, an 80-year-old human cell to a nearly embryonic one. That's an extreme uh, case that kind of proves a point that you can uh, really uh, go long distance in epigenetic space in reversing as many cell-based phenotypes as, you, as we've examined so far. But good question, thank you. Alejandro or Kristen or Nir or, or Jim, yes. anybody else want to take that? I would actually like to add into that one. I think uh, clearly with the reprogramming, just like uh, George said, uh, in vitro, we can uh, basically reverse the age of a cell back to an embryonic-like state. But even if we want to go uh, farther and if we look in nature, that's basically what uh, fertilization and reproduction does. No, You are combining uh, all sides and eggs from uh, individuals that have a certain age and you generate a new individual that will have a normal lifespan. So I think even reprogramming is already trying to mimic uh, a natural process that occurs uh, every day. And just super briefly, there are some animals out there that are like us, mammals, but that live hundreds of years like bowhead whales. So there are some efforts, scientific efforts, to try to figure out what's different and if we can copy some of their secrets. But but it, I think it's still early days and, and it's challenging. Okay, really short add-on. Do you guys think that germ cells are ageless? Mm, I just, I would say no. Uh, they, they still age, and this is why... Uh, they don't have the same reproductive capacity, no? The all size from a 20-year-old versus a 40-year-old is definitely not the same. So I would say, yes, they are still age, yes. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, Nir, unless you have somebody else uh, or something else to add, maybe we can go to the next question. I'll, I'll just say that um, to, to pick on the last comment, we can measure the aging of ovaries and testes, but... When a, a sperm fertilizes an egg and the, the baby is developed, then there is an erasement of age there. And that's why we're so optimistic that we have figured out naturally how to do something like that. So how can we do it in a whole body and when it's post-development? Thank you. Okay. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Nir. Michael, you're up next, if you want to ask you. Yep, thanks, Avi. Great panel, Laura, Nathan. Great combo, everyone. Do you guys think that there's enough you know, evidence that aging is modifiable at this point, that convincing a majority of society is just a matter of more time and more propaganda? Or do you think there's going to have to be additional big milestones in the lab before a majority of people are able to be convinced that aging is modifiable. I, I can start it by saying that, yeah, first of all, there, there's no doubt that we have overwhelming data that aging is uh, modifiable. Over a, over really, uh, the extent of the data is impressive. And part of the reason that people don't understand it is, for example, if you're in cancer, 
cure cancer, this is a really hard task because every cancer has its own genome that is different than the genome of the guy who has the cancer, and it's different than any cancers like that in the world. So you have to be very personalized in doing that. Aging is really conserved through evolution, okay? And that means that everybody kind of age the same way, the skin, the hair, uh, the skeletal, the diseases, the cancer, they are different, but the diseases are the same. And that is why some of the drugs and some of the interventions that we're giving are working in all animals, not only. So I think really the idea of targeting aging not only has been proven, it's simpler than some of the tasks of dealing with diseases that are already there, whether it's cancer or sarcopenia, frailty, it's too late for that. So I think we have enough data. It's more of our marketing, publicity, and people believing that this is here now. Thank you, Nir. Kristen has to jump off soon, so maybe she can answer before leaving. And thank you again for being here with us. Oh, sure. Yeah, just a last comment. And thanks for a great panel, guys. But yeah, I think the right kind of marketing could go a long way. I think there's too much focus on the sort of sensationalist stuff that in some ways put people off aging. So focusing on on the, the real science and the real developments, I think that that said, if we actually had something working in a human, someone got their hair back even, I think that package would make it even more compelling. But as people mentioned earlier, that the field has been so chronically underfunded, that even straightforward approaches to get the word out there, I think would, would, could make a big difference. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna hop off now. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you again for being here. We're gonna go to our next question. Pat, please go ahead. Hello everyone. I was just wondering, I was always curious if nanotechnology, if it was available, would it be possible to target certain um, things in the body at a cellular level to reverse aging if there was the availability of nanotechnology like tiny robots that you breathe in to they go through your body and repair cells or something along those lines if the technology is being worked on or if it's too far away from even being uh, available. This is George Pat. I, I published on nanorobots that, that were in, biologically inspired and I would say that the nanotechnology that works, that ha has been working and is likely to continue to be appropriate for this task, at least, is bio nanotechnology. And biology is already amazing. It can, it, it, it can make things that are atomically precise at scale in the catalytic core of bio nano machines, a fraction of an angstrom, a fraction of an atomic bond matter to the catalytic rate and that can be finessed not just through ancient evolution but through modern machine learning and accelerated evolution through highly parallel synthesis so i think your intuition that nano devices is good i think the most effective ones now and probably for quite a while will be bio nano there's we're not bio nano is not necessarily limited in the periodic table a huge fraction of the periodic table can has been incorporated into either natural or synthetic biology. So I think that's where we're going to see a lot of progress that you can call nanotechnology if you'd like. Thank you, George. We're going to move on to our next question. Uh, thanks for your question, Patty. It was great. Aidan. Hi, my name's Eden. Thanks for taking my question. I'd like to ask the scientists what, obstacle, what obstacles they're facing in their research that might delay or prevent progress. Thank you. Alejandro or Nir, do you want to take this? Or Jim, as an investor, you're also welcome to say something. And I think you mentioned it very succinctly. It's a lack of funding. Yes. Yeah, I, I just, uh, just, uh, just to underline that, I think that's, uh, that's the key. And so everyone needs to, on this call, needs to try and find ways of getting people interested in this sector. Yes, I, I agree 100% funding is, is key, but I think large funding, I think, is coming, but more will come in the moment we provide the first uh, human data. I think connecting to the question before, 
we have good data in models that we can slow down aging. I'm not sure about reversing, but at least that we can slow down aging. I think in the moment we have human data, uh, then uh, things will change uh, significantly, even if it's with a simple drug, with whatever, just uh, showing human data that aging can be uh, modified. And I think even there, a point that just mentioned before, I think pets, uh, whether it's cats, dogs, they're going to play also a fundamental role in convincing people that you can really extend health span and life span uh, because yeah this will be much quicker yes especially with millennials having less children dogs take uh, over that space so it's a, they're like family it's a huge industry as well <laughs> pet care and accessories and all of that with that said thank you for your question Eden Masha welcome to the stage and thanks for being here Oh, hi everyone, uh, I'm Masha, I'm an asset manager, and thank you for having uh, this great panel, thank you for the time, for your knowledge. And uh, my question uh, will be to George Church about one of the companies where he's on board, about IntelliTherapy. In the end of the June, uh, the company announced that they're going into human trials, and I want to ask you if you, can ask, if you can tell us more about this project. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Do you expect? Yeah. I'm sorry, I was, uh, your voice was a little quiet and I didn't catch the name of the company. Intelia, Intelia Therapeutics. Intelia. It was Jennifer Dudna. Oh, oh, Intelia. Okay, yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. At, at, so Jennifer and I have been involved in Intelia and in Editas, and they both, and CRISPR Therapeutics are three siblings that are all within a few blocks of each other in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I think they get along pretty well overall and have divided up the landscape for rare, both rare um, genetic diseases, as well as more common ones, including infectious diseases. None of them are working on the most common one of all, which is the topic of this conversation, which is slowing down or reversing diseases uh, of aging. But yes, uh, some of those, not just the CRISPR-based therapies, but also gene therapies in general, are really undergoing an explosion of success and investment. And this is partly because of the Orphan Drug Act that makes that possible. But I also look forward to these powerful technologies being applied to more common diseases. And I think part of the problem is it's easier to get approval for devastating diseases, especially devastating rare diseases. It's easier to get the approval process to work right now. But as soon as you show a few of those, and, and that's already been done for editing and gene therapy for sickle cell and uh, for ret retinal diseases, for example. Thank you, George and Masha, for your question. We're going to go now to Reinhold. Please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, thank you, Laura. Thank you for organizing this amazing room. We should have more like this one. My question relates to senolytics. There's been a lot of promising data uh, on preclinical animal models, mostly showing the benefits, the potential benefits of using different various senolytics. And now we are starting to move into clinical trials, so testing this in humans. Now, my question is, and sometimes when you hear companies spin out talking about senolytics, it's almost a fight of whose who senolytic is most potent and most efficient. My, my question relates to the potential talk toxic effects. So when you have, when we use them in the lab, they are certainly very effective. And when we work with endothelial cells and they are senescent, they, they can get wiped out 80, 90 percent. So they do work. My question relates, what happens if you don't have cells to replace those? So let's put an example. If you have an aged brain and you have a few neurons there, so are you better off with keeping your old neurons than, than wiping them out and having none? So that's my question. Thank you. I, I can take it maybe, and you're obviously a little bit more on senolytic, but let me explain something. Senescence is a protective mechanism, okay? If something goes wrong with your cell, um, they might become a, an origin of cancer if you don't eliminate them by senescence or by uh, apoptosis. There are several mechanisms. The problem is that they accumulate, and when they accumulate, they have a biology that has to do with secreting proteins and other things, and this biology accelerates aging, okay? So you need to remove those cells, but you certainly cannot stop the process of senescence because it is a protective uh, mechanism. Uh, understand that point. And look, um, 
what, what happens out there is we know it happens everywhere. Uh, 95% of our drugs are failing. Okay, that, that's why Jim is saying he's investing in 20 companies. But senescence is a mechanism that is relevant to human. And it'll take time, maybe sooner rather than later, to have uh, better and better drugs. Thank you, Nir. I believe that you do have to leave soon. So we're going to ask everybody to uh, be very uh, clear with their questions. So we try to get everybody to get to answer, to ask. Dr. Isa Gould, welcome to the stage. Please go ahead. Thank you, Let me in. Hi, everyone. My question was to Mr. Mellon, but I think he left. And my question is about uh, senolytics. Uh, is there anyone using enzyme therapies as a senolytic drug or anyone thinking this could be a future? I'm not an expert in the field, but I think people are trying uh, a lot of different strategies. I didn't hear before about the enzymes, but the company that comes to my mind is, of course, uh, one skin that is using a peptide to eliminate senescent cells in the skin. But yeah, mm -hmm. not enzymes that I know. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Alejandro. Um, John, you're up next. Hi. Yeah, in terms of market sizes, I think every year we spend about uh, half a trillion dollars on injury. And relating that to aging, has anyone... Or what's the state of kind of hibernation, so slowing down the aging process so that you can buy yourself time to find a cure or treat a battlefield wound? I don't think there's application, uh, uh, there's really application that I know to that. Uh, it's believed the cal caloric restriction that extends life in animals by a lot, by 40%, that the metabolic rate is uh, reduced, but... In fact, you have to look at it not as a whole animal, but per gram of muscle or any active tissue. And I'm not sure that we're convinced that just changing metabolism is going to extend the uh, lifespan. It's, I don't see it as, as any company, uh, any of the biotechs who are thinking about this approach. I think, that slow, I think that slowing things down is great for trauma, where you can spiral out of control and have multi-organ failure in, in hours. But aging is a much, typically a much longer deal. And slowing down one's life for decades is not really a, a great option. I, I think we should all think out of the box as much as possible. So right. let's use that well, for inspiration. I think slowing down my body's aging would be interesting. My mind still goes full speed on the internet, but I guess I'm thinking more from that perspective. Is there a separation between mind and body there with the, the hibernation? We'll probably have to do another series exploring that. Thank you, John and George and for answering those questions. Chris, you're next. Hi, guys. I just wanted to say thank you so much uh, for all the panelists and all the hosts for this a fantastic talk, really. And my question is, what has, what has not been mentioned today which you are most excited about in the longevity or the tackling aging field? I think we've done a pretty good job of covering the landscape. There are definitely deeper dives that we could take on each of these topics. There's the whole issue of systems biology integration that we've touched upon where you might have to get a bunch of things right at once. There's the issue of delivery. I think that's something, no matter how you deliver, whether it's a small molecule or a cell therapy or anything in between, you, you do have to deal with delivering not too much off target and so forth. So, but these are more deeper dives into things that we've, we have touched upon. Yeah, and I, I, I totally agree with it. I think except on thinking of regeneration that is really complex, I, I don't think we have a technological obstacle. A lot of those things can be developed in the next few years. Um, so from a technological pro problem, except, as I said, except regeneration or regeneration of the brain is just uh, impossible to think about even. But, uh, but otherwise, it's not the technology that holds us. <laughs> it's other things. Biology. David, your last question of the, of the afternoon. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Thanks very much um, for letting me speak. It's been really interesting. I had a kind of broad question. It was great to hear worms being mentioned, but it's about basic biology. We still need to understand a lot more about basic biology. For example, in the E. coli, we only know 
you know, almost half of, well, about a third of the genes we don't know the function of. Do we, if we really want to understand how an organism ages, do we just need to know a lot more about the biology? Is it that really, you know, as Jim was saying, we need much more investment. Do we really need kind of step change in our understanding of biology before we can really get to the bottom of aging? That's what my question is. I want to maybe start by making it some somewhat simpler. You're saying, look, I know I have examples. Aging is really complex and we don't argue with it. What we say, though, is that there are like upstream mechanisms a lot of them we know, and a lot of them we will discover that can be targeted a whole phenotype that you see of aging, okay? So I, I what we miss the describing aging, and a lot of them, and they can be targeted. So I, I don't want it to be a, like so much and we don't know. I think we know a lot of the important things. I would add that in order to tackle E. coli, we don't need to know the remaining 50%. I work on E. coli, among other things, and antibiotics and uh, vaccines work, are working quite well without uh, complete knowledge. We have to be careful not to let complete knowledge of the perfection of science interfere with engineering. For example, our knowledge of both virology and immunology were not only primitive, they were non-existent when we started developing smallpox vaccines back in the 1500s and 1700s. And even by the time smallpox was eliminated, we still had very primitive knowledge of virology and immunology. That's not a, I'm not advocating ignorance. I'm just saying that don't let perfection interfere with engineering. The engineering, you can work with a fairly limited palette uh, and still come up with amazing outcomes. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with that. I, 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 in a way, we were doing it in a slightly empirical way. That's how we found a lot of antibiotics and other things. It's, and yes, we'll, we will find some great things that way. But I was just wondering if we need a, that much more understanding to really get to the grips with aging. That's that was. Yeah. Well, I think we will get tons of understanding, partly because we're in an exponential phase. Even though Nir says we don't need more technology, we are getting more technology, and it's bringing the cost down and it's bringing the knowledge up. So we will have it. But it's not just trial and error, and it's also engineering. You can engineer with a very limited number of parts and make some amazing devices. I, 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 George, I didn't mean to uh, say we don't need technology. I meant that, that we could make progress with the technology that we have that we should do now, and it's not uh, stopping us. I certainly yeah, hope I, the technology will help us. I agree. Yeah, I, I, I get your point. Alejandro, I, do you want to say something as well? Yeah, I would like to add something. It's true. One of the questions I think was going to be if we know enough, no? if we have enough knowledge. I think we have some, but we could always uh, learn more. And I think we need to take both a rational and an irrational approach. No, We need to have a rational approach based on what we know and then try uh, sometimes random things no? uh, and, and reiterate again. No, We gain something, we learn more, and we try again something again. I think... It needs to be a balance between the two. I completely agree there. Uh, knowledge, technology, and they will both uh, fit each other in order to keep uh, to keep going. Thank you for that. So with that, we are going to end the panel discussion now. I wanted to thank, again, our panelists and the audience for being here. We are going to continue to do this series, and you can hear the recording of this on thefutureoflongevity.org. We Nathan, Avi, and myself, and myself think it's important that we have this discussion so that you hear directly from the scientists and the people work actively working on this field. I think we touched on a lot of amazing topics today and subjects, and we want to thank everybody that was here for their time. And as we know, everybody's very busy. And let Nathan and Avi say their thank yous. And of course, our panelists can also have something to say before we end the room. Yeah, thanks, Laura. So just the, re the recording of this session will be found on uh, futureoflongevity.org. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody, the hosts and all the great panelists that we had today. I just also want to mention if anybody in the audience is super interested in doing something about aging, maybe starting a company or joining a startup uh, in the longevity field, definitely reach out or, or go to beyonddeck.com for the, the On Deck Longevity Biotech Fellowship Program that we just launched uh, two weeks ago. I'll hand over the mic to Avi. 
Thank you, Nathan. I just want to thank Nir, Alejandro, George. Thanks for staying on and answering all the questions in exquisite detail. I know that you guys are very busy and yeah, thank you again for staying and uh, chatting with us. One other quick thing, I love Fidelity and everything that Nir, Alejandro, George, um, Jim, Jay, and Kristen said, not only did we record it, but we'll also make a transcript of it and break it down into Q&A mm -hmm. and answers from individual speakers. I personally liked how Nier brought in literature of Dorian Gray. And so th that was really entertaining. So we should, we will have that at the futureoflongevity.org detailed transcripts from this talk for those who want to go and check that out. Yeah. Thank you everyone for being here. This is absolutely fabulous. Can I just say, I, I hope we convince you we're not false messiahs. Um, and I think it's really what we'd love is for you to spread the Gospels, really, that this is real and we need the wave and we need each one of you to spread it so we can be successful in the other end. Thank you so much. It was a great panel. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Nir. Alejandro, George, did you want to say something before we end the room? Just thank you. Thank you to everybody, organizers and participants and audience. Thank you. George, we hope to have you back to talk about pet longevity for sure. <laughs> okay. I'm happy to come back. Yeah. Awesome. Alejandro, thank you for staying with us. You're in Europe. Hope to have you back as well. And with that, Alejandro, like, I'll let you say. Yeah, no, thank you as well. This was um, well, thank you again to everybody in the audience for staying with us, and we hope to see you in other panels and have, have an opportunity to continue these conversations to spread the word of longevity. Have a great afternoon and a great summer, and uh, see you all soon. Thank you again.